Okay, I know that uh, we've got people who are still joining us, but uh, in the interest of time, we will get started. So good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. I want to begin by uh, thanking our sponsors, three incredible corporate citizens uh, who are just always there for us. Thank you to Circle P Paving, Meridian Credit Union, and B4 Networks. Uh, I also want to thank Creative Dining by Angie for preparing our amazing boxed lunch for many of our guests. Many thanks to the logistics team at uh, Miller's Auto Recycling for planning the delivery routes and to the following directors who literally got into their cars to deliver your food. Uh, Jonathan George, John Van Brussel, Adam Lantman, Barb Scarlett, and Angela Hudson. Thank you so much. Um, it is such a pleasure for me to be able to welcome you all to our annual International Women's Day event. Um, we've experienced a very different year with challenges, opportunities, and um, some real fears. The one thing that has not changed is that women worldwide have been instrumental in caring for families, uh, for friends, neighbors, employees, co-workers, organizations, small businesses, and corporations. We, we have risen to the challenge. And while there's still work to do today, um, oh, today we're gonna celebrate. We're, we're just gonna celebrate. We celebrate our strength, we celebrate our compassion, we celebrate our tenacity, and we certainly celebrate each other. I'm very excited to introduce you the three women who are on our panel today who um, will be sharing their own unique story about their lives this past year. Throughout our conversation, if you have any questions, uh, please submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, depending on time, we'll do our best to, um, to get to the questions at the end. All right, let's introduce our panel. So Lorraine Jensen is the Chief of Medicine and Medical Program Director for Niagara Health. She is directly responsible for over 90 physicians, her interests include improving patient flow and the uh, patient experience, and she is the co-chair of Niagara Health's Patient Flow Steering Committee. Clinically, uh, she works as a general internist and palliative care physician. She completed her medical school and residency training at the University of Toronto with additional training in quality improvement. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her husband and two children. Welcome, Lorraine. Uh, Stephanie Defoe is the Chief Operating Officer for the Niagara Falls Bridge Commission. She joined the Commission in 2001. Stephanie holds a Certificate and Diploma from Niagara College and Bachelor's from Brock University. And she's also obtained her Certified Human Resource Leader designation. In her capacity as COO, she oversees both the Canadian and US operations consisting of human resources, security, facilities, maintenance and operations, Government Affairs and Media Relations. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks. Leanne Briggs uh, has worked for the uh, District School Board of Niagara for 22 years. She has taught English and special education, worked as program leader of a special needs department, was a consultant for special education at the DSBN, and most recently, she's program lead of student success at Greater Fort Erie Secondary School since its inception in 2017. She lives in Stevensville with her husband of 26 years, has a son who currently attends post-secondary school and has a daughter in grade 11 at Greater Fort Erie Secondary School. Welcome ladies, thanks for joining us. So let's, um, let's rewind to a year ago. What was life like? What was going on in your professional world and how were you balancing work and life. And um, Dr. Jensen, let's let's start with you. Sure. Thanks, Dolores. Um, so as you mentioned, I attended the University of Toronto um, for my medical school and internal medicine uh, residency, and I moved to Niagara in 2015 to practice medicine. Prior to COVID, I was working as a full-time hospital-based general internist, General internal medicine, for those who don't know, and my husband would be included in that group of people who don't know what I do on a daily basis. Um, we care for the vast majority of adult admitted patients with common presentations being things like pneumonia, heart attack, stroke, sepsis, liver disease, so pretty broad. My job includes admitting patients from the emergency department, consulting on surgical, mental health, 
and obstetrics patients with medical concerns and working in our acute internal medicine clinic, as well as rounding on inpatients who are already admitted. I also practice palliative care across all three acute sites of Niagara Health, and this works out to be about 30% of my practice. We had actually just formally set up our general internal medicine-led palliative care service prior to the pandemic. I work approximately one weekend a month and on average two to three night calls per night per month when I'm in the hospital from 5 p.m. until 7.30 a.m. the next day. All patient care prior to COVID for me was in person. There was very little virtual hospital-based care and so it was therefore necessary for me to be at the hospital to provide patient care. Similarly, prior to COVID, most meetings were in person. There was often a call-in option, but overall it was often felt that in-person meetings were more effective. I would therefore often go into the hospital on my days off of clinical work to attend meetings. My administrative role at the time was the site lead for general internal medicine at the St. Catherine site of Niagara Health, where I was responsible for the approximately 20 general internal medicine physicians at the site and the performance of the department. This was a busy role as it was the biggest general internal medicine department at Niagara Health with the most inpatient medical beds at our site. There were constant bed pressures. I was also the clinical teaching unit director for the Niagara Regional Campus of McMaster Medical School. I work regularly with medical students, physician assistant students, and resident physicians, and was involved in the day-to-day -day operations of our internal medicine rotation. Medical education is something that I am very passionate about and I am proud that we have a regional medical school campus in Niagara. I was and still am the co-chair of the Patient Flow Steering Committee. And this is really focused on improving the patient experience and patient flow at Niagara Health. I worked at the hospital most days and did have administrative duties that spilled into the evenings and weekends. In terms of leadership development, I was enrolled in the academic leadership program through McMaster University. The first part of this was in person, but it was later completed virtually. It was no secret that the healthcare system was strained before the pandemic. There were constant bed pressures and we were always working to reduce our emergency department length of stay and to help patients effectively navigate and flow through the healthcare system in Niagara. I had started working with community family physicians to help support ambulatory care and to prevent hospitalization if at all possible, because we know that there's good evidence that a focus on ambulatory care and providing care at home results in improved healthcare outcomes. Before the pandemic, my son Colton was six and in senior kindergarten, and my daughter Kaylee was three and in daycare. My husband Brian previously worked in Toronto, but had secured a position as legal counsel for Niagara Region where he still works. We lived in St. Catharines at the time, but have since moved to St. David's, still well within Niagara, and my children were and still are proud members of the DSBN public school system. We accessed before and after school care to meet our professional schedules. Both the YMCA after school care and our daughter's daycare were phenomenal. And conveniently, both were located in my son's school, which even more conveniently was located five minutes from the hospital. Despite this, I had been known, and it's a bit of a joke amongst my colleagues, to run across the hospital parking lot in a panic to make it to daycare and after school care pick up by 6 p.m. But I'm very proud to say that I was only late twice and the care providers were so kind and understanding and kind of let it slide. Some of my colleagues do have a nanny, but this was not something we wanted to pursue. Although my children are not the most athletically motivated, we were also busy with activities such as swimming lessons, soccer, skating, and there was never a shortage of requests for play dates. We were busy, but it was manageable. I have a close-knit family who live in and around Hamilton, and as my kids are the only grandkids on my side of the family, there were always extra hands around and volunteers to babysit. So like I said, pre-COVID, busy, but manageable. Great. So pre-COVID, um, you just didn't sleep. Is that about right? <laughs> <laughs> I have been. I have been asked if I sleep. I would say I have been sleeping less during the pandemic, and I think you'll get that when I talk about my life during during COVID. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think the key for me was that I was able to reach out to friends and family if I needed support. And so, you know, I think that's one of the big changes all women have experienced during the pandemic is that that loss of, of contact and that ability to depend on others. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. All right, Stephanie, let's, let's hear about your life uh, pre-COVID. 
Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's honestly such an honor to be kind of on this virtual stage, I guess, with these incredible women. So uh, I just want to honestly take one second, though, to say that I've been a part of the Niagara Falls uh, Chamber Board for approximately a year now. And I just wanted to say that Dolores is an amazing demonstration of the strength of women in leadership. Um, she really works tirelessly to provide a voice and support for businesses in Niagara. So honestly, thank you so much, Dolores, for everything you do for all these businesses that are on the line. I know it's much appreciated. And if there was a sound, I'm sure we would have a nice standing ovation for you because I know, I know they all cherish what you do. So thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you. Um, as Dolores said, I work for the Niagara Falls Bridge Commission. I'm currently in the COO role, um, which owns and operates three of the international crossings in Niagara Falls here. And when Dolores asked me to speak, I thought, why me? Like, what does anybody care about what I have to say? And then I realized nobody might care, actually. But then again, there might be like one or two people that might relate to what I'm going through or might walk away with just really a better understanding of someone that they might be working alongside. And so I thought, you know what, here I am. So prior to COVID, I was responsible for human resources, um, agency relations and security on both the Canadian and the US side of the border at all three of our ports. And um, much like Dr. Jensen, on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, with my electronic leash. So, because um, if it isn't a human resource matter, um, it's a security matter um, on either side of the border. And so I found that that was sort of my reality. I have two very active little boys, eight and 11. Um, I'm lucky to have a really um, supportive husband who is an IT manager here in the Niagara area. Uh, I have a CEO and a board of directors that um, values women in leadership as well as work-life balance. Um, some of you may know that the international bridge and tunnel world was very male dominated when I started 20 years ago. To be honest, I was probably one of the only women at any of the conferences that I went to, but I was very blessed to have uh, inspirational male role models that really respected, cherished, and supported my career. And not once did they care that I was um, female. They respected me for, for my work ethic and the contributions that I brought to the industry. So I, I'm, I, to be honest, I consider myself to be extremely fortunate and privileged to be where I am and to have the support that I've had over the years. And I know that's not an experience that every woman has, but for me, it's just been such a great road. And the, the, the people in the international bridge and tunnel community have, have really just supported me so well throughout it. So I've been very lucky. Um, like so many of you, though, prior to COVID, I was juggling my professional career with um, what included like a fair amount of travel between Ottawa and Washington, active kids and everything that goes along with keeping up a household. And much like Dr. Jensen, I, you know, I chose, you know, my own personal preference, but not to have a maid, not to have a nanny and um, definitely take advantage of the before Loretto Durden before and after care and all of that goes along with it and I was right alongside Dr. Jensen with being like the 15 10 minute late mom running in the door saying just charge me for the extra 15 minutes I'm so sorry I got stuck at the border and so um, I can totally relate to that and um, it, it's something that we you know definitely go through you know, a typical day for me, I drop my boys off at seven in the morning and then I'd pick them up at 6 p.m., which gave me like a solid 10 hours of perfect time to focus on my professional responsibilities. You know, my evenings were dedicated to my boys with the odd interruption from work. And then when they went to bed, I would fit really an extra one or two hours of work in and then do a few things around the house and call it a night. And you know, on the weekends, while I'd work a bit on the weekends, or I might be away from time to time on business, weekends were mostly dedicated to my boys for, and anybody that knows me, I spent a lot of the time at the arena in the winter, I was coach Stephanie, um, and at the soccer field in the summer. So, so I did get to have a little bit of time on the weekends with my boys. You know, and I looked at like, how do we do it? How do we juggle all of our professional careers and families? And the thing is, we're all doing it. We, we're all balancing life and, and everything that it throws at us. And while for each of us, the path 
and the things that we're juggling may look different. I mean, it's important to recognize that we're all experiencing similar feelings. We all have those moments of guilt. We all have those moments of stress. We all have those moments of anxiety. We all get overwhelmed from time to time. And that was prior to COVID. That was before any of this even happened. And we had those feelings then. So like a lot of parents, I too struggled with balancing my career and family. There were times when I'd pull into my driveway at six o'clock at night and a neighbor would say, are you just getting home now from work? And I'd, that feeling of guilt would creep in and I'd be like, am I spending enough time with my boys? Am I not being the mom they need? And I'd question everything. Um, but then my husband would remind me, you're a great mom. You're setting a great example for your boys. And you know, he was right. You know, being a good mom or a parent it looks different in every family, right? And so what I learned was to let that guilt go and just focus on the positive things that my work life is contributing to my family. And I learned to be confident that I'm making the best choice for my whole family, including myself. And I kind of took comfort in knowing that my children will, you know, they'll feel the extent of my love and they will understand that sacrifice. And so that, that really helped me with that piece of it. And then the organization piece, and I don't know, ladies also probably on here can relate. Without that, I would be lost. My husband and I share an Outlook calendar. Absolutely everything goes into it. Literally like it's your turn to pick up the kids today. It's my turn to pick up the kids today. And that helps reduce the stress level that I have because I'm really confident that nothing that's important to me or my family is going to get dropped. And that's been something that's been um, really like kind of a game changer for me. And I know for sure that what my boys need is going to get taken care of by one of us. Um, spending quality time with the family. So when I'm not working, I really try to spend the most amount of my free time with the boys and my husband. And I try to eliminate as much of the distractions as possible so that when I'm not with them, I know they got the best of me um, when I was. So that really helps for me to reduce some of those feelings that creep in from time to time. And then integrate work and personal um, when possible. That's been something that I've you know, more recently done. Um, when I'm working in my home office, oftentimes I invite the boys to join me. So they've helped me make PowerPoint presentations. I've had them reading the Canadian labor code and tab every page that says the word vacation. Um, and the funny thing is they like it because they just want to be around you, right? They just want to be with you. And it's like, and they still get to spend time with me. My work gets done and I get the added bonus of they actually get to learn some of the stuff that they're learning at school and how it connects to the real world. And it's kind of funny because they do PowerPoint presentations at school and they're like, now it makes so much sense, mommy. I know why we do them at school because you have to do them when you get older. And it's like, you're right. Like there's, there's a connection there. And so that's been giving me a lot, you know, even before COVID, that was something that we did a lot. And then for me, much like Dr. Jensen, just finding a child care provider that I was able to trust was crucial for me to have peace of mind when I was at work. So a little different from probably everybody else on the call, I work in the US. And so I only got eight weeks off with my second child, which for most of you would seem crazy. But in the US, that's a reality for most women. Uh, most of them take between six to 12 weeks off. Um, I had a C-section, so I took the extra two weeks and took eight weeks. But knowing that my child was being cared for um, at where I, somewhere where I trusted was a huge peace of mind for me at work. And it, it made it me able to go to work. And then the last was just like for me before COVID was connecting with other parents and laughing together, sharing stories. That helps me always realize that you're not in it by yourself. And so that was particularly important this past year. Like a friend of mine um, works at the St. Catharines COVID Assessment Center and had two little boys the exact same age as mine. They go to school with me. And just talking to her and the support and the support she had during COVID, it just gave me so much strength. And just knowing that she was experiencing the same feelings and emotions was so comforting. So for me, I mean, that was really what my life looked like pre-COVID and sort of some of the stuff I did to balance that work and family um, prior to COVID. Oh, fantastic. Again, I don't know when you sleep. It's, uh, it's funny, my, my children, uh, my two daughters are adults. Um, but as you're talking, I'm, I'm really taken back to when I was living those days. And, and now that I'm past them, I always think, 
how the heck did we manage it all, right? <laughs> so you guys will all get there, I promise, I promise. <laughs> all right, Leanne, let's, let's hear what you were doing pre-COVID. It's funny that you uh, you say that because I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Those days don't seem that long ago, but how did we manage? Right. Um, so I'm often asked, um, what is a student success teacher? What is it that you do? And that's a difficult question to, to answer. If you speak to anybody in the field, anybody who teaches student success, uh, you probably get a different answer from, from every person. Um, but my job is to help kids be successful, uh, plain and simple. And as we all know, uh, success is measured in a variety of ways. It doesn't look the same for all people. And the same thing is said for students. Uh, no two students are the same. What is success for one is not necessarily success for the other. Um, no two days in my profession look the same. Uh, it helps to keep me on my toes, which is a good thing. And one of the first things I learned is you have to be flexible. You have to be open-minded uh, to do my job. Um, every generation insists that uh, adolescent life was harder for, for their generation. And there's no doubt that um, teenagers today have a lot more to deal with than maybe we did when we were in high school. There's the whole social media monster out there. Uh, mental health is on the rise. And then now these kids have had to live through COVID. Um, teenagers remain very uh, egocentric. They don't think the whole world revolves around them. So if their world is crumbling and they're stressed, um, even if it's only their perception, how can they be expected to come to learn every, uh, school every day and sit down and learn in a classroom? It makes it very difficult for some. Um, so we have to be empathetic uh, for kids and what they're experiencing and, and try and help in any way that we can. Um, in my career, I've worked with at-risk or in-risk students almost my whole career. Um, one, what makes one student at risk uh, can be completely unique from another. So what is a student success teacher? My job is to mentor kids and advocate for them in their time of need, no matter what that need is. Uh, the teacher in the classroom assesses and evaluates and I'm there to advocate for the students. Um, some adolescents that I work with um, who may be at risk could be for a variety of reasons, could be social, emotional, may not have anything to do with school whatsoever. Uh, some of them may be at risk academically. They could be misplaced. They may need extra help. Um, sometimes it's attendance. Sometimes there's long periods of um, absence from school for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one integral part of my job is to help problem solve. I'm a problem solver. I work with an amazing team here at GFS. We meet weekly to discuss students um, how to help, how to get them back on track after that long absence away from school. Um, maybe they're having issues with peers. Uh, again, with the presence of social media out there, there's a whole new gamut of problems that these kids have to deal with that we didn't. Uh, everything is in the here and now for them. So problem solving around how to get through that on a daily basis is part of my job. Uh, uh, academically, you may have to set them up with before school help or uh, help at lunch after school. We have a variety of different subject uh, teams that will help students. Uh, in different subject areas. This is all pre-COVID, of course. Um, and then there's just the uh, added stresses that they have for maybe not fitting in uh, to certain peer, peer groups. So I'm by no means a counselor. That's not part of my job, but I do help uh, triage kids towards the amazing resources that we have here at GFS, whether that be youth counselors or social workers, um, school nurse, and then we have outside, uh, connections with outside organizations as well. So I help to connect those students with whatever supports uh, they need at the time. Um, my job can be to provide individual timetables for students. Maybe a student doesn't have a full timetable because at the, at the moment that's not what they need. Um, we do credit recovery. So if a student falls short and fails a subject rather than having to take that subject completely over again from the beginning, can we look at what they have done and then recover that credit so that they can uh, catch up to their peers? Uh, we provide alternate programs. We have um, alternate environments for learning because again, what's good for one may not be uh, what's good for another. So in the classroom, once students are re-engaged, we're in the business or I'm in the business of, of helping kids earn credits. 
Um, I meet with students, liaise with the classroom teacher, uh, talk about what next steps are needed to move them forward, always looking to move forward. And then of course, communication with home, uh, whether that be phone calls or, or meetings with family. One of the nice parts of my job um, is I get to help transition those students from grade eight uh, to high school. So I know um, the ladies on the panel have young children, but one day that'll be, uh, they'll be meeting with a student success teacher who will help get them ready for that scary thing uh, called secondary school. And it is surprisingly, it's a year uh, long uh, job. We begin in the fall. And I often say to the kids when we would go into the grade eight classrooms, you've just started grade eight and here we are talking about high school already. But we want them to be as comfortable as possible when they get here. Um, so it does start early. For the ones that are already here, uh, I help to transition them through that four year plan, sometimes a five year plan uh, to getting their high school diploma. So things like their community service hours, their achievement of credits, um, those that are looking for after school jobs, we talk about options for that. And then uh, I do have a bit of a guidance background as well. So we look at researching um, post-secondary opportunities and um, uh, employment opportunities outside of high school. So it's a very rewarding job. Um, sometimes the kids fall, but the nice thing is I get to watch them get back up again. Uh, and meet with success, which is amazing. Small steps, small successes. Uh, gradu graduation does eventually come. Doesn't look the same for all students, but they all do get there. As far as my home life, um, as every woman can attest to, it's a balancing act. Uh, I'm fortunate, my kids are a little bit older. Um, I have two teenagers. I have a 16 year old who's here at GFS with me. And I have a son who just started uh, university in the fall. So they're pretty self-sufficient, but of course they do need that occasional nudge even from me, you know, get that homework in or get that essay into your professor. Um, and then of course there's the added responsibility that every woman feels that pressure to organize it all, to manage it all, to feel like you're in control of everything, you know, 95% of the time. Um, both of my students are athletes, something that my husband and I are very proud of. So there's the constant driving, the constant practices, the extra meals, because they seem to eat six meals a day, not three. Um, snacks on the go. Um, both of them are working, so they're trying to balance jobs and school. Um, there were weekend tournaments all over the province. So doing that in my free time on weekends and then having to return back to work on Monday was exhausting at times, um, trying to run a household and be a good partner and a good wife, et cetera, et cetera. So nothing that hasn't been shared by um, the two ladies here this morning. I'm no different than thousands of women out there just trying to find time to breathe, get it all in, stay sane before you got to get up tomorrow morning and do the same thing all over again. But um, I wouldn't have it any other way. That's great. And, uh, you know, I'm just listening to all three of you, and this was all pre-COVID, busy, busy, busy lives. It's amazing. So I, I, um, I want to take it back to the present now. And um, I, I want to hear what, what your lives have been like throughout the pandemic. What have been some of the biggest um, challenges, changes, um, inspiration that you've experienced? Um, and Dr. Jensen, we'll, we'll bring it back to you. Sure, thanks. So, you know, I, I, I know everyone feels this when COVID really hit a year ago in March of 2020, it turned everyone's lives upside down. Um, but I truly believe that the impact was probably felt most by women. And, you know, when I was reflecting on, on today, I did a bit of reading and you don't have to go any further than major news outlets like CNN and The Guardian to see articles on how women have been hit the hardest with job losses, you know, sometimes forced to leave the workforce due to childcare, as well as decreased research productivity, again, often due to, you know, those other responsibilities such as childcare. And then I came across this year's theme for International Women's Day as choose to challenge. And I truly believe that we can all choose to challenge and call out gender bias and inequality and that we can choose to seek out and celebrate women's achievements and accomplishments. And this is the optimist in me for today, but I truly believe that we can all help to create a more inclusive world. And so I really like the message of, of International Women's Day today. Um, 
so certainly professionally, my responsibilities increased uh, significantly during the pandemic. So all patients who unfortunately got COVID, if they did not require ICU care, they were all admitted under the general internal medicine service at the St. Catherine's Hospital, which is my department. In the first wave, I spent six weeks total, two on palliative care and four as the physician on the COVID ward uh, in the first wave. And, you know, those were extremely challenging weeks. And um, what I saw was, was just truly heartbreaking. Um, you know, watching firsthand residents of Niagara, most of them elderly suffer from COVID and sometimes, you know, die of COVID was I think the greatest challenge that I faced over the past year and what we all faced as a team at Niagara Health. Um, you know, for me, those people are not numbers in a news story. They were real people. They were grandparents, they were moms and dads, and it was just heartbreaking. But I think what came out of that was that I witnessed our team at Niagara Health step up in such an inspiring way. Um, the pandemic had tested our teams like never before. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that the healthcare system was already under stress. And so it's not like we started in a great place, but it's been so impressive to see how our teams have gone above and beyond working with our partners in the community to provide safe, high quality care and to support one another during the pandemic. I think our team has really shown resiliency, dedication and commitment, and it has just shone bright in these challenging circumstances. And I have never been more proud of our team at Niagara Health as I have been throughout the past year of the pandemic. We also reached out, not just within the Niagara region, but to our partners across our LIN. So I was asked to, see, to sit on a LIN regional COVID planning committee and then an operations committee. And uh, I was the only female physician leader on that panel. The rest of the physician leaders were men. So I was very excited to have my voice heard at that table. And it was just inspiring to see the collaboration across the region. And that was really in an effort to support both scheduled and unscheduled care in the face of COVID. And so COVID care was consolidated to four main hospital sites in our Lynn, Hamilton General Hospital, St. Joseph's Hospital, Joe Brandt, and then the St. Catharines General Hospital. And so we did transfer patients to and from um, other sites. And we met regularly to ensure the process was working. Those meetings were at 7 a.m. So started my day nice and early. I also participated in regional call to help with these patient transfers. Um, locally, we also created a call system so that we as hospital-based physicians could support physicians and patients in long-term care. As we all know, long-term care and retirement homes were disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And so I think one thing that I did see was that, you know, despite all of the terrible things that happened, COVID really did bring the medical community together in an unprecedented way. And that's something that I really hope continues. Clinically, my work expanded as well. So I've worked in all three COVID assessment centers, and I was one of the first physicians to work in the first clinic at the Greater Niagara General Hospital. More recently, I have found probably the greatest joy in the pandemic in working in the vaccine clinics. I was just vaccinating yesterday. Um, and, you know, I have, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Dr. Jen Frendo, an amazing colleague of mine who has really set up those clinics and, and really ran with it to get people in Niagara vaccinated. But vaccination was also another challenge and stressor for us. Um, you know, I think if I look back, my darkest days in the pandemic were in early January when we were seeing um, pretty high numbers of, of deaths to COVID in our region, really high numbers of outbreaks, both in our hospitals and also in long-term care. And we didn't have reliable access to vaccine. And we were, we were watching other sites and other places in Ontario receive vaccine. And you know, it really felt for a while like we were on our own. Um, but, you know, I think I really credit my colleagues on the Medical Advisory Council at Niagara Health, our president, our chief of staff, colleagues in the community who really advocated for those vaccines to be delivered to Niagara. And, um, you know, we, we wrote an open letter to the media that was picked up. And fortunately, now we have a much more reliable source of vaccines. So, I'm happy that I'm participating in this talk now rather than the beginning of January because you may have gotten a bit of a different vibe from me. Um, despite my inc increased clinical responsibilities, meetings were now virtual. So that did allow me the opportunity to work from home when I could. And my daughter has made regular appearances on Zoom meetings. And I think my colleagues enjoyed seeing her, or at least that's what they tell me. 
Um, Niagara Health also became very active in research trials during COVID. And at last check, I'm, in, I'm involved in five of those. And it's been so exciting to see cutting edge research come to our community and us to be able to offer those treatments to, to patients who came in with COVID. And our research lead, who is another wonderful female physician, Dr. Jennifer Sang, has been so effective throughout the pandemic. And I, it's a pleasure to work with her. And then in December of 2020, I um, was fortunate to um, take on the role of Chief of Medicine and Medical Program Director for Niagara Health. Um, you know, the medical field, especially within the physician side of things, um, is often led by men. But I think Niagara Health has really promoted and celebrated female leaders both before and during the pandemic. And I'm just one example of that. Um, you know, it was a big step for me with more responsibility, but I felt that my experiences both before and during COVID did prepare me well for the transition. Personally, we did face challenges as a family. So my son, Colton, who I mentioned before, who is now seven and in grade one, developed speech disfluency. So he has a stutter likely due to stress. And that started during COVID when he was off during the first batch of virtual learning. So we started doing virtual speech language pathology appointments and now we're doing them in person. Um, he really struggled with virtual learning and not seeing his friends. And I think the effect of the pandemic on children, you know, really can't be understated. Um, you know, my mom, who's my personal and professional role model, I still remember she said to me, you know, Lorraine, you're only as happy as your least happy child. And I think that rang especially true during this, during this pandemic. Um, our usual support network was gone as we retreated into our little household bubble. And we did struggle with childcare at times, more running across the parking lot just at an earlier time in the day. Overall, though, I, I do view myself as extremely fortunate because I know that there were women who lost their jobs and, um, you know, had more stresses than I did. And I had job security. You know, I felt privileged to provide health care to the residents of Niagara. And fortunately, um, my family and I stayed healthy throughout the pandemic. We also felt very well supported by Colton's school. And I think that DSBN really rose to the challenge of virtual education, which cannot be easy. So my hope overall for the future is obviously that we get through the pandemic together. I'd love to keep vaccinating people so we get there and that we are able to spend time with our loved ones again. But I also hope that we hang on to the good things that have come out of the pandemic. So the collaboration in healthcare across the region, virtual healthcare, which does improve access for those with mobility um, or healthcare reasons that they can't come to in-person appointments. The work from home philosophy, which I found extremely helpful when appropriate, and the focus on family and those other responsibilities that often fall to women. And I have felt very supported at Niagara Health. But I really think that today is more than just my story. And there's so many people within the healthcare system that have made such wonderful contributions, especially during the pandemic. And I've mentioned a couple. Um, but I also want to reflect on all female role models, family, friends, colleagues, and inspiring women in our community and at my organization at Niagara Health. Thank you. And, and um, thank you for the care that you've provided. I mean, for, for those people who, who suffered from COVID and, and um, you know, for those who passed away, you were one of the the people, right, uh, to care for them and to be with them. And, uh, and for that, um, you know, we all thank you. So that, that's just a, a great story. Thank you. All right, um, let's move on to Stephanie. Stephanie, how has life been? Sure. Um, at the beginning of COVID, um, you know, like so many of you, life changed both professionally and personally for me. Professionally, I was faced with the pandemic and where rules in both Canada and the US and for workplaces were changing daily. They were not the same from country to country. So this just meant literally just working around the clock to rewrite protocols. And I would, I would no sooner get the protocol rewritten and then there'd be new guidance issued <laughs> like literally four hours later and I'd be updating. So for me, it was just this very, um, kind of hamster wheel feeling um, for the first, uh, especially the first probably month or so, while everything was just shift, shifting and changing in, in my world. 
Um, normally, you know, on a, any given day, um, I would have uh, one or two employees um, at a time going through major life events, right? That, that as an HR person, I'd be there to help support those employees and get them the resources that they need. During COVID, all of a sudden, now all of my employees are going through similar issues all at the same time. They all need answers. They, they all had childcare issues. They had aging parents they were scared for. They had kids that, had, that couldn't do the things they wanted to do or that they loved. They had anxiety about being um, at the front line of the border and and the risk of bringing the virus home to their family. And so all of a sudden I went from one or two employees that you're typically managing in a day to having all of them having different um, issues and concerns. Uh, and the guidance was changing and it was unclear from day to day. Um, and then I had board members who wanted answers. I had a CEO who wants answers. The public wanted answers, right? The public wants to know when's the border gonna reopen? When can I cross to see my family? When can I go to my cottage? And then my kids wanted answers. My kids wanted to know when they could see their friends. When can I get back on the ice and play hockey? I felt like for two months straight, every single person just wanted answers from me. And I, ha I didn't have any, and like no one had answers, but it didn't matter because decisions still had to be made and it had to be done with limited information, which for, for anybody um, is, is a scary situation. Um, I'm a type of person that likes to make my decisions based on all of the facts that I can possibly get my hands on. And so when you're telling me I have to make a decision with all this limited information, it's a difficult and stressful time. Um, so that was something that I really experienced those first two to three months of the pandemic. Um, really having to set aside what is traditionally kind of the way I manage um, and, and be like, okay, well, I don't have all the information, but I got to make a decision based on, on what I do, you know, uh, and what I do know. So um, for me, that was, that was a little bit of a challenge, uh, letting go of some of that control, um, which I'm so used to having. So that kind of, that kind of was a little bit stressful. We had to transition our employees, much like most companies to remote operations where possible and put all kinds of protocols in place, you know, to help protect the mission critical employees that needed to remain on site to keep our ports open and keep that essential trade and travel flowing back and forth across the border. So we also had to find a way to get a lot of our Canadian employees that were working in the US back to the Canadian side because when it first happened, crossing the border was so uncertain at that time, we didn't really know how everything was gonna play out. And so there was just a lot of stuff that had to be done in a short amount of time and uh, a lot of answers I had to get to those employees quickly. So honestly, for those first few days or for, for the first little bit, the border crossing restrictions, um, when we had the pandemic, the border crossing restrictions, we were really in just disaster recovery kind of business continuity mode and trying to figure out how to get a sense of control and stability over the operation. Once we got that sense of control and a little bit of stability, then we could start looking at more of the operational resilience kind of agility side of the business. And I think a lot of businesses went through that, right? Dolores, we've talked about this so many times, but we've seen so many business ha businesses have to change sort of the way they deliver services or pivot the way that they've had to do business. And we were no different. We're no different. And a lot of people experienced that. Where we were fortunate, um, we had very strong pandemic plans and business continuity plans before this even happened. Um, I've been with the commission for quite a while, and so I've been through H1N1, I've been through SARS, I've been through the avian flu, and I've done a ton of tabletop exercises with our partners at both Canada and US Customs. So we had a pretty solid plan in place to get started with, which was good. So we were able to really move quickly and implement um, like we, we started screening our employees like within two days after um, we kind of shut the border down and then waited for public guidance, which ultimately came out to say screen your employees. But this was something that we had already had in place for the border. And so we were really fortunate from that standpoint that we were able to move quickly on guidance and then kind of wait for public health and stuff to catch up and give us more specific kind of COVID measures and then just sort of adjust our plan accordingly. 
And so just all that pre-planning really did pay off. And it, it, you know, back when we made those plans, we never thought we would ever have to use them. It was like, it was like, yeah, yeah, but it'll never actually happen. I mean, the border will never shut down because of a pandemic because it's not going to happen. And here I am a, a year later and just, it's surreal. It's surreal to be think that we've been shut for, for a year, but i um, grateful that we've taken the time ahead of that to, to work with our partners to make sure that the plans were in place. Um, with the border still close to non-essential travel, we're still working really hard, honestly, on the maintaining the financial stability piece um, and just instilling confidence in our bondholders and giving our employees the security they need. Um, much like Dr. Johnson, our employees at the front line are what are keeping this going and they've really rallied behind us and they've really done everything they can do to support the commission on this. And it's just extraordinary to see how they've pulled together during this. And I'm, I'm, I can't honestly say how proud I am of those guys. It's just unbelievable um, what they've done to make sure that trade keeps flowing across this border. So it's, it's really, it's really them that deserves the kudos. Um, and then the last big professional challenge that I faced was really um, one of our senior executives retired. So I took on additional duties, which included taking over all of maintenance, all of facilities and all of operations, which was really not my wheelhouse. And so um, that change alone was stressful in itself because now all of a sudden I had everything but finance and IT reporting to me here at the commission for both countries. So, so that was a little bit of a change professionally. Personally, like many of you, my kids were home from school, which meant my time that I typically dedicated to my professional responsibilities was being blurred with that family responsibility. Um, but honestly, the result of that was that my kids had to grow up really, really fast because mommy was at home working, but they really needed to fend for themselves. Like they figured out how to put popcorn in the microwave, like all kinds of things, because it was like, well, I guess she's not feeding us, so we better go figure it out. And so they definitely grew up so much faster. Um, and an added bonus, and much like Dr. Jensen, for somebody who would normally drop my child off at daycare at like seven in the morning and not pick them up till six and really only have a couple hours before bed, I saw my kids more than I've ever seen them. And I know that's not that's not how everybody um, experience was, but for me, it was kind of a blessing to be able to even have kids on their little computer at my feet while I'm working um, was awesome. So that for me was a big, big, big thing that I never got to experience, um, especially being like my kids went to daycare at eight weeks old. I've, I've never seen them really um, during the week. So it's, it was really, that was really cool for me. Also, my role as a mother expanded to include teacher um, to some extent, right? Which I think all of us experience that have younger kids, which caused, you know, an added level of responsibility and stress because I wasn't sure how I was supposed to fit all that into my day. I always, I felt like my day was already full as so I didn't know where I was going to put that, but we established new routines and the boys, um, I really worked with them to figure out how to manage their, taught them how to manage their own education during the day. And honestly, and, and I know, again, this isn't everybody's experience, but online learning became such a rewarding experience for all of us. Um, my boys absolutely loved the online learning and I loved being a part of it. I was able to see what they were learning during the day and in the evening I could take that break it down and and kind of recraft it to meet their learning style. So my youngest was about 13 levels behind in reading which is really far behind he was quite quite a ways behind. And by the end of June last year he was caught up and he had a love for learning again, and so. For me, I kind of somehow I, I miss a little bit, you know, that they're back in class because I'm out of the loop and I only see what gets sent home. So there's like an opportunity there, I think, worth exploring. Like for us, it was it was really honestly a great experience. Um, and some of it's because life slowed down, right? For me too, a little bit, like in my personal life, the kids weren't at, I wasn't at the arena seven nights a week. I wasn't trying to fit swimming and curling and all these different things in. So I had a little bit of extra time to dedicate to helping them with some of their schoolwork. So uh, in the evening, so it did work out for us. Um, but I'll say, honestly, it was, it, that was a really rule kind of a weird uh, thing that we didn't think was gonna go as well as it did. And it actually ended up being a, a great experience. And we really truly kind of got to know our kids a lot better that way. Um, another big challenge for me, and, and I've talked to Dolores about this, but a, a huge challenge for me and personally was that I don't pass any of the screening forms. And 
um, that was like a huge, it's really weird to say about it. It was really hard. Like the coating on my eyeglasses is peeling off and I can't get an eye doctor appointment. And I, cause I failed the screening forms and I just want new eyeglasses. You know, I can go and get them here in the U S but I want to get them in Canada. And uh, at the beginning, even when the grocery stores were screening people, you know, the first person they ask is, have you traveled outside the country in the last 14 days? And it's like denied. And for me, it was like, what? I'm Canadian. Like, I don't understand. I just want groceries. And so for me, that was like a little bit stressful. Like, I, you know, I finally did find a dentist um, that was willing to take me after a lengthy conversation about, you know, the, the level of risk and stuff that I'd be putting them at. Um, but yeah, for, but some people might, you know, don't understand, but it was, it was definitely a weird thing. And like, when you have your children with you and they know you cross the border every single day, the last thing you want to do is lie in front of your eight-year-old because he's going to totally call you out on it. So, so that was, that was difficult. That was definitely difficult. I finally had to take, explain to them, like in some circumstances, when they say travel, they mean like, has mommy gone on vacation? And the answer is totally no. Mommy has not gone anywhere on vacation because or else we like there's certain things we just for at the very beginning, we would have had a hard time just even getting certain services. So, um, you know, it was it was definitely trying. I think from a personal standpoint, that was one of my it's still something we're going through and we're still trying to work through it. Thankfully, Ontario did update um, their screening document, but most people haven't gone on and got the updated document. So it's still a challenge. So for me, really, the past year has been a lot of challenges, a lot of ups and downs. And like Dr. Jensen, there's a lot of things I, I hope we can carry forward into the future. And then there's definitely some things that I'm hopeful that they will be forgotten. But um, there a lot of good came out of out of the year as well. And sometimes I think, you know, we lose sight of it. But I'm hoping that we will be able to carry some of these positive things forward. Um, they say that from challenge comes change. And I honestly believe that's true. We will, like, we're going to build back better, you know, and I think it's going to be true for every organization, for every company. They're going to find the things that work and it's going to, it's going to change and transform business as we know it. So anyways, that's my, my, my thoughts, Dolores. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Stephanie. And, and you're so right. There are are nuggets of, of um, good stuff that sounds strange, but nuggets of good stuff that, that have come out of this. And I think it's that, that balance, right? Um, sometimes we get so caught up in, in, in being busy every minute of every day. And um, we've, we've all been on pause a little bit. And um, some of that has been nice. So I agree with you. And I also agree that the first two months we're very stressful because, uh, you know, we went into it thinking, okay, this is going to be a couple of weeks. So let's not change too much because we'll all be back to normal very soon. And um, after two months, it was very evident that that was not going to be the case. And, and here we, we still are. All right, Leanne, how about you? What, what is going on with you? <laughs> well, everybody knows um, how the pandemic has affected schooling and education. Um, we've been inundated with it in the media from the beginning and just hearing the stories here today, um, you know, when, when the pandemic hit and how, how did it change? There was this new technology and for many of us, we were a stranger to the technology, parents and teachers and students alike. Um, there was all of a sudden limited communication, a uh, whole spectrum of emotions, fear of the unknown was common for, for all. Uh, students, parents, and teachers. Um, all of a sudden, the caregiving was multiplied. For those of us who are fixers, um, all of a sudden, we couldn't fix what needed to be fixed. Um, probably the biggest challenge for us was not seeing the kids face to face and losing that relationship. Uh, most of us got into teaching because we love kids and we enjoy working with them. And it's why we do what we do. It's a passion for many of us. So to have that suddenly taken away was one of the biggest challenges. Um, for some families, uh, there was no technology at home. And I don't know that everyone realizes that, but some families didn't have internet uh, or there were limited computers, maybe um, one computer and three elementary students and a high school students in one home. So how do you manage who uses the computer at what time? And if mom and dad are working from home, perhaps they need the computer for work. 
So these are all things that changed our, our day to day uh, within the school system. I had many conversations with parents who just simply had a lack of knowledge. Um, I don't know how to get them on this Google thing and what's Teams and uh, I try and click something and I get kicked off. So it, it was a life lesson for, for many people. Um, personally, um, my son was in grade 12. Um, so last spring when, when everything hit and shut down, uh, I feel like he missed out on so much. He didn't get a graduation. He didn't get a prom. Um, the hockey team here at GFest uh, won SASA and they were heading off to OFSA. And for a student athlete, that's a huge deal. And that was taken away from all of the kids. But for a senior in their final year to not experience those uh, fun and exciting things that our memories, we all remember our graduations, our proms, whether we went or not, you remember your final year of high school. It was taken away and it was sad, uh, sad for me as a mom, uh, not no less a teacher. I grew up or my kids grew up in this community and um, I've watched a lot of these kids from the time they were four and five years old come through the scoring system and, and to not have the uh, pleasure of watching them cross the stage in their graduating year, you know, I was, I was disappointed. But you have to look to the positives and you have to look to the future and, and some of the solutions. Um, and what did we do and how did we make it work? Uh, I'm happy to say GFES lent out over 375 computers to families in, in need, so for students who needed them. Uh, the DSBN provided internet for over 75 families so that these kids could log in and, and do their work. Um, through DSBN Cares and uh, the Ridgeway Lions, we gave over $5,000 in gift cards to families in need. Uh, because of the generosity of staff and people in the community. Uh, we were introduced to Microsoft Teams. So all of a sudden now we were taught and encouraged uh, to reach out to these kids uh, via this new to us platform. Um, and it was a game changer. It meant that we could have that face to face with kids again. So even things like staff meetings and transition meetings and parent meetings, you know, not unlike today, they could happen again. So the, the normal things of a school day were able to take place once again uh, through the technology. Um, I did speak to a number of my colleagues because I'm simply one voice for all of the educators out there. And I can speak from um, a teacher who has teenagers, uh, but I spoke to a number of women to get their uh, inspiration and their positive stories. Um, those of us that don't have children, um, they said that they, were, they have a new appreciation for the struggles that the students felt with the technology. So it's one thing to be uh, given the, com uh, the computer programs and to learn them. And there was a sense of pride in that, but then now you have to deliver the content to the kids. So there was a lot involved in that. And a lot of the teachers said they felt uh, proud of their accomplishments, but they, they gained a new respect for the students and what their struggles um, with dealing with the computers and logging on and getting work done and submitting it and all of the things that went along with it. Uh, we assume that teenagers know everything, but <laughs> as we all know, they don't. Um, as mentioned before, um, gave us more time, gave teachers more time to call parents, to speak to parents and to listen to some of the struggles and the, the things that were happening in different people's homes. So they appreciated that, that they had the time to actually listen and talk to parents. Um, they were able to learn new things. They were able to work on their homes. Um, they were able to help neighbors and family members uh, with the technology because they now felt like they were knowledgeable. And then of course, I've heard many, many people say that uh, they were able to get outside and there was a new appreciation for nature uh, those of us with young children, so the ladies on the panel today have mentioned it and I spoke to my colleagues. One of the most important things is they felt that there is a new acknowledgement of what working women do on a day-to-day -day basis. So if one of the positive things that could come from that is that acknowledgement. Um, with the stresses of working from home, uh, teaching virtually, having your own kids now working from home, everybody all under one roof trying to run a home, it was the new normal. And some of these women said that they realized how off balance their lives truly were.
but they felt that it was a blessing because now they were forced to slow down and get things on track and take care of their own uh, well-being, uh, which is a good thing. They were able to be present with their kids. So as Stephanie mentioned um, in her own experience, being home and working and being present with your own children while trying to uh, do your career at the same time. Um, another thing that they mentioned was um, they realized how important that day-to-day -day and face-to-face -face interaction with students and teachers really is. Um, I don't think any of us realize how important having children in the classroom face-to-face um, -face, uh, what it meant both to the teachers and to the kids. They need that. They crave that. And um, uh, this was an eye-opener, I believe, for, for a lot of women. And then for those of us who, who do have older children, uh, teens are taught about mental health. It's part of the curriculum. They're inundated um, through the media uh, about mental health and, and um, now they were living it. So they were experiencing the stresses of mental health and it became a reality for all, but that's a good thing. Um, taught them resilience. Um, I feel it allowed for a lot of good discussions in a lot of homes. Uh, we were able to, to teach kids coping skills and give them strategies and tools that they need, um, telling them that it's okay to be vulnerable. They saw that the whole world was vulnerable. Um, taught them to be self-starters. Uh, you're in charge of where you end up in life and, and through COVID and uh, coming out on the other side, um, gave them the resiliency, I believe, that, that they're gonna need for, for life. Um, taught them patience. It taught uh, many students patience and that um, some things are beyond your control and that's okay, it's one step at a time. And again, that whole flexibility thing um, after parents, um, parents having to teach their own kids at home, I've, one of the, the best things that I've heard over and over again, uh, is the appreciation that parents, grandparents, students, and people in the community now have for teachers and what they do on a daily basis, because most parents became teachers and it's not an easy, not an easy thing. So I think, um, it's suddenly a reality. Uh, for a lot of people to see what the kids go through, what teachers go through, uh, because they've experienced it firsthand. Um, so lastly, as I speak for all women in my profession, I would think that um, they would all agree that one of the most positive things for us right now is actually being back in a classroom face to face with students. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I, I could certainly see that. And, uh, you know, you mentioned balance. And I think, I, I hope, I hope um, that that balance stays with us uh, long after COVID. Um, I think it was something that we needed to, to just realize, and, and many of us have. Um, it, it has been a, a long year, and I think everyone is, is tired, uh, tired of the uncertainty. Uh, tired of the restrictions, tired of not being able to connect with, um, with loved ones. Um, what is the one piece of advice, just a, a little piece of advice that, that you'd like to share to just help us all get to the finish line? We're, we're so close now. And Dr. Jensen, we'll, we'll start with you again. Well, I have to mention vaccines. Um, so vaccines are coming, get your vaccine. It's going to be the best way to get back to quote unquote normal life. Um, and so, you know, if anyone has any questions about vaccine, if there's any concerns, you can contact me personally and I will get you the answers because I feel very strongly that when you're offered a vaccine, you should take the vaccine. Um, so if there's any concerns, uh, my, my email is always open. Great, and thank you for that. That's great advice. And if anyone uh, does have any questions, you can reach out to our chamber office and we'll certainly connect you with Dr. Jensen. Stephanie, piece of advice. 
Yeah, I mean, I, we're so close to, I think, um, some semblance of normal. And if I could say one thing is just please keep doing our part, you know, keep your mask on, um, social distance, don't let your guard down and let Dr. Jensen and her team do their thing um, and get us the vaccines because we're, we're, we're almost there and it just don't give up now and and end up increasing those numbers because that's not helping anybody. So I'm just hoping everybody can just hang on for this little bit longer and let all of our healthcare professionals help us out and get us there to the finish line. They've been incredibly strong and they've been holding the line for so long. So let's just do our part and make sure that we, we do our part to hold the line and help them out for this little tiny bit, which is a little bit longer. That's great advice. And Leanne? Um, from an education perspective, whether it's parents or students, just keep looking forward. Don't look forward. It's not a race. Um, parents, the kids will get there uh, one step at a time and um, just keep looking forward. It's only going to get better from here. You're right. I'm with you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jensen, Stephanie, and Leanne. Uh, the three of you really represent so well what many of us have also experienced I think it's uh, conversations uh, like this that help us understand that we're, we're not alone. We're, we're all in it together. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who's joined us today. Um, in closing, I just want to, I want to offer a toast. <laughs> Next afternoon, so we're going to have a toast. <laughs> to all of the incredible women uh, in our lives, cheers. I'm going to take a little drink. Cheers still bubbly. Um, and now everybody go celebrate you because you deserve it. You're doing a great job and, um, and you're wonderful. So cheers and have a wonderful day.